Welcome to this video. In this video, what we're going to talk about is a really important concept uh, in the um, field of cardiovascular physiology, which is the control of blood pressure and the control of blood volume. And uh, as the video develops, we will see how interrelated controlling blood pressure and controlling blood volume are. Okay, so let me start by giving you an overview then for what we're going to talk about in this video. We're going to start off by going over some models for the cardiovascular system. We'll start off with a nice simple model of the cardiovascular system, pretty much the simplest model you can have of the cardiovascular system, and then we'll make it slightly more complicated. Now, I do want to introduce the simple one before we go on to the complicated one, uh, because uh, the simple one contains a really important concept uh, that uh, I don't want to be overshadowed by the extra details that the more complicated model gives. Um, so we'll go through a simple model of the cardiovascular system, we'll then take it up a step, make it slightly more complicated, because we will need that more complicated model to understand uh, the interrelation between blood volume and blood pressure. Okay, then what we'll do is we'll actually begin going through the homeostatic mechanisms that the body has for controlling blood pressure and blood volume. So we'll talk about the baroreceptor response for controlling blood pressure short term, and then we'll talk about the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system for controlling blood volume and thereby blood pressure uh, more long term. Okay, so that's uh, the overview then for this video. So I'm going to start off with this uh, basic model of the cardiovascular system. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to imagine that I am building a human being and I am building the cardiovascular system. So I'm going to build it one step at a time. So I'll start by building the tubes, then I'll put in blood, then what I'll do is I'll actually turn the heart on and understand how uh, you're actually going to then build a system which is capable of pumping blood around the body and perfusing tissues. Okay, and this um, model, as I say, contains really important concepts that you need to understand about the cardiovascular system to understand uh, the importance of blood pressure and the importance of blood volume in controlling blood pressure. Okay, right, so we're going to start then by building the blood vessels. So initially we're going to imagine that I haven't put any blood into these blood vessels. All I want to do is actually build the blood vessels. So the two major um, different types of blood vessels then that I'm going to start off by building are the arteries and the veins. So I'm going to build the arterial system and the venous system. So I want this as a nice big picture in the centre of everything, so I'll put it here. So I'm starting here by drawing a tube that is going to represent the arterial system. So this over here, this is going to be representing the arterial system. And by the arterial system, I mean all of the massive great arteries. So for instance, the aorta is a massive great artery. That will be, uh, whoops, not arterial systems, arterial system. Uh, the aorta is a massive great artery. That will be included in um, this, you know, it's being represented uh, by this tube, along with all of the big branches off it, so the carotid arteries, the renal arteries, the subclavian arteries, all of those are now just being represented by this great big tube here, and I'm colouring it in red, but that's not supposed to imply yet that it's got blood in it. Okay, so this uh, big tube is representing all of the uh, massive great arteries, and I know that they're you know, their actual structure is far more complicated than one tube, but as far as having a physiological model is concerned, they might as well all just be one big tube like this. Okay, yes, in actual terms of anatomy, they are, it's, you know, the big tube looks far more complicated than this, but as far as this very simple model is concerned, this big tube represents all of that incredibly complicated arterial system network. Okay, then we also need the venous system, which is the massive great veins. So, for instance, the uh, superior and inferior vena cava and all of the great big uh, veins that drain into them. So, this over here, this tube is going to represent the venous system. And again, anatomically, of course, it's far more complicated than this, but as far as this very basic model is concerned, one great big tube performs the same role as an incredibly complicated network of tubes that are all draining into each other. Okay, and I'll colour the venous system in here 
in blue, but again, I'm not implying that I've got blood in it yet, I'm just building the tubes at the moment. So I've built a venous system and an arterial system. Now, I'm going to have connections between the arterial system and the venous system, and there are going to be two major connections that we need to understand. The first is the microvasculature, and the second is the heart. Now let me firstly put the microvasculature on here. So the microvasculature is the means by which um, blood is actually going to perfuse the tissues. So the arteries and the veins, the, the vessels of the arterial system and the venous system, these are not actually supplying oxygen and nutrients to the tissue. Instead, there are tiny little vessels that are in between these two, and they are the ones which actually supply uh, nutrients and oxygen uh, to the tissue and take away waste products. Okay, so connecting these two then, we're going to have the microvasculature, and I'm just going to draw one of these, but of course there'll be a huge number of these. And the basic principle of the cardiovascular system is that we're going to have a pressure gradient between the arterial system and the venous system, and this pressure gradient is going to force or drive a blood flow through the microvasculature, which is then going to keep our tissue perfused with blood. Okay, so here then is a venule on the venous side here, so I'll just label these up. So this is representing a little arteriole here, very small little blood vessel, barely bigger than capillaries, and here this is representing a venule, and then in between them of course we'll have the capillary bed, so I'll draw this here now. Okay, so the arteriole splits into capillaries, and then the capillaries reconverge to form the venule like so, so I'll colour this in. So we'll have the arteriole coloured in here in red like so, we'll have the capillary bed, and I'll firstly just enable this up, so this is our capillaries, or I'll call it the capillary bed, and this is of course where a lot of the exchange is actually going to occur with the surrounding tissue, and I'll colour the capillary bed here in in yellow, like so, and remember all I'm doing at the moment is building blood vessels, we're going to take this very nice and slowly and build up uh, our cardiovascular system, so at the moment I'm just building blood vessels, so here's the capillary bed, and then I've got a tiny little venule, which is all the capillaries of the capillary bed reconverged up, which will then be draining into the venous system. So, basic principle so far, I've got an arterial system and a venous system, and in between those two I've got the ability for blood to actually move from one to the other through these tiny little blood vessels, firstly an arterial, which then splits into a capillary bed, which reconverges to a venule and drains into the venous system, okay? And if blood moves through this, then that's obviously going to perfuse the tissue and uh, supply it with oxygen and glucose and take away waste products. Okay, so this, what I've just added on here, is the microvasculature, and that is a connection between the arterial and venous system. Okay, now let's add on the other really important connection between the venous and arterial uh, systems, which is of course the heart. So let me now add on the heart here. Now I'm going to have a very simple model for the heart. I'm just going to model the heart as having a single chamber. Remember, I'm trying to make a very basic model here. The heart is horrendously complicated in having four chambers. It just makes things far too complicated. As far as we're concerned, we're discussing the control of blood pressure and the control of blood volume and basic model of the cardiovascular system. We can just think of the heart as having one chamber. Firstly, of course, the atria, you don't actually even need those, you could get rid of the atria of the human heart, plug the inferior and superior vena cava into the right ventricle, plug the pulmonary veins straight into the left ventricle, uh, and you're done. That would function perfectly well as well, uh, as long as you put some necessary valves in there. Um, but indeed, in many animals, you don't have atria, you just have a two-chambered heart where you have the two ventricles. However, even a two-chambered heart is too complicated for me. I don't like the pulmonary circulation, that just makes things complicated, so we're going to get rid of it, and we're just going to have one chamber of the heart, and we're going to accept that magically, when the heart pumps blood through it, the blood gets oxygenated. Okay? We are not studying, the reason I can make this simplification is we are not studying how the heart oxygenates blood. All we are trying to understand is how the heart pumps blood around the body. Of course, there's no point in pumping the blood around the body if the blood isn't going to be oxygenated at some point, 
but uh, we're not studying that. We are just studying how the heart can function as a pump. And to understand how the heart functions as a pump, we don't need to worry about the pulmonary circulation. So I've got rid of the pulmonary circulation, and we've just got a one-chambered heart here, uh, and we're just going to accept that magically, when the heart moves blood from the venous side to the arterial side, that that blood gets oxygenated. So when the blood passes through the heart, it gets oxygenated. So that's a huge simplification, but it's a simplification that's going to make it easier to keep track of things inside your head. So here is my one-chambered heart, now coloured in in purple. Okay, so there is the um, structure of the cardiovascular system as far as the tubes are concerned. And at the moment, I have not turned the heart on. Remember, all I've done so far is construct a system of tubes. I've got, here is my venous system connected up to the heart, which is then connected to the arterial system. And then there's this other connection around here, which is the microvasculature. Okay, so let's go another step further in building our cardiovascular system. We've built the tubes now. Uh, let's actually build, well, let's put some blood in this. Uh, so how much blood do we generally put uh, into a human cardiovascular system? What is the general blood volume in a human cardiovascular system? Well, the average blood volume is around 5 litres. And just to add a little bit of extra information on here, Approximately 2 litres of that volume is made up by red blood cells, and the 5 litres is then made up by the suspension that the red blood cells are in. So the rest of the 5 litres, which is 3 litres, is made up by the suspension that the red blood cells are in, which is the blood plasma. So hematocrit, often abbreviated down to HT, which means the fraction, or the percentage rather, whoops, hematocrit, the fraction, no, sorry, not fraction, the percentage of the blood volume that is actually uh, red blood cells is generally around 40%. So hematocrit is generally around 40%, so that means that 2 litres of this blood volume is then going to be made up of red blood cells. So I'll just put this down. So RBCs, red blood cells, will make up about 2 litres of this. Uh, and I should again put the approximately equal to rather than the is actually equal to symbol. Uh, and uh, the blood plasma will then make up the remaining 3 litres approximately of this. Okay, right, so we put then into our cardiovascular system 5 litres worth of blood. Now, here is a really important concept to understand. If you just have built my, the cardiovascular system and you built the tubes, and at the moment you haven't put any blood into them, instead the tubes in their lumen have got air, okay? And the air's got very little pressure to it, okay? So I haven't pumped air in there, I haven't blown it up like a balloon, instead I've just let air go in. Then the, the, the amount of volume that there's going to be inside those tubes is going to be less uh, than um, the volume of blood that we're going to force in. So when we instead now try and force this blood in, that we're going to distend the cardiovascular system. Uh, basically, I'm trying to force in more blood than is the natural volume for the cardiovascular system to hold. So uh, what will end up happening then is it will end up being blown up like a balloon. So I'm going to force in 5 litres in, but that's not the natural volume for this tube system that I've built to hold. So what instead is going to happen is all of the blood vessels are quite elastic, so they're going to uh, expand, they're going to be distended outwards. Just like a balloon where you blow air into it and it distends, it expands, okay? However, this is going to mean that the blood is going to have to have a pressure, and I want to make sure that you understand why the blood must have to have a pressure, and what that actually means. So, we'll use the analogy of blowing up a balloon. So if I blow up a balloon here, okay, let's say I initially pinch off the open tube here, uh, then of course the air stays within the balloon because there is no way for the air to get out. But then if I release my pinch here, what will happen is the air will all very rapidly be expelled out of the balloon. Okay, now it'll make a funny noise. Why is that happening? Well, it's because the balloon wall has an elastic recoil. It's generating a force continuously inwards. Now, before I well, when I've got my finger pinching over here, the air cannot escape, and it's generating a pressure back 
backwards to press against the wall of the balloon. It has to be, otherwise the wall of the balloon would move inwards. Okay, if there was an, if forces weren't balanced, then you create motion. Uh, that's Newton's first law, isn't it? If forces aren't balanced, or is that Newton's first law? Um, it might be Newton's second law, I don't know. Anyway, it's one of Newton's laws that if the forces aren't balanced, then you create motion, you create acceleration. Okay, so uh, if it weren't the case that this elastic recoil of the wall of the balloon was balanced by some other force pushing outwards, then the balloon uh, would uh, recoil inwards, even though I've got my uh, finger over the edge here. Uh, so the air creates a pressure that is pushing back outwards. And similarly, in the blood vessels, so in my distended blood vessel, so if this is my blood vessel that has now been distended by having the blood put into it, so here it is, and now we've got blood inside here, there will be an elastic recoil in the wall of the blood vessel trying to force the blood vessel to recoil back down, okay? And that force will be balanced by a pressure that the blood has, which is pointing outwards like so. So that is what is meant when we say that the blood has a pressure. It has to have a pressure because uh, that's what is stopping uh, the walls of the blood vessel recoiling back inward, which is what they want to do, what there is a force driving them to do, but that force is balanced by the pressure of the blood. Okay, right. Uh, so now a theoretical concept. We force this five liters of blood into the cardiovascular system, but at the moment, did I say that we turned on the heart? No, remember I'm building this. I'm in control here. I have not turned on the heart yet. The heart is just a perfectly uh, motionless tube at the moment, along with the rest of it. So what's going to actually happen is the blood is going to evenly distribute everywhere. Now the venous system, I'm going to say that's much bigger than the arterial system. Indeed it is in humans. The venous system is much, much bigger. There's much more volume over here than there is in the arterial system. So most of the blood will obviously end up in the venous system. But everywhere you'll have the same pressure created. Okay, so there will be a pressure created everywhere because we're, um, we are... Um, forcing in more volume into this system than it was actually built to take. So it is now actually having to distend outwards. Uh, and that pressure will be even everywhere. Okay, This theoretical blood pressure that you would have everywhere if you just put the volume, the normal blood volume, into the cardiovascular system and had the heart turned off, so had no pressure gradient anywhere, it has a special name. It is known as the mean systemic pressure or the MSP, so this stands for the Mean Systemic Pressure, okay, the MSP. Right, and normally the mean systemic pressure is approximately 7 millimetres of mercury. Millimetres of mercury is just a unit of pressure. So that's the normal value for mean systemic pressure. So I hope you understand what is meant by that. It's a theoretical concept, okay? In a alive human, their blood pressure should not be the mean systemic pressure because that indicates that the heart isn't doing anything. Um, but it is a useful theoretical concept to understand the model of the cardiovascular system. So we've forced in this 5 litres of blood into this tube system that I've created and it's now got a pressure of 7 millimetres of mercury everywhere and that's known as the mean systemic pressure. I think we'll have a break here and in the next video what we will do is we will turn on the heart and we will see how that's going to create a pressure gradient between the arterial system and the venous system and how that's going to drive uh, a flow of blood through the microvasculature which is of course the whole purpose of the cardiovascular system.